Good morning and welcome. Welcome to Sandals Church, man. I know some of you are still trying to find a seat. We're going to talk about heaven today, but parking will feel like hell. So just know that and uh, try to have Jesus in your heart as you leave. And let's give all of our parking lot people a hand today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, let's, let's give a hand to our, our children's ministry. You know what you dropped off. So yes, we love them. So I'm so glad you guys are here today. We're going to celebrate Easter. If you're new to Sandals Church, I've never been. I'm hilarious, so laugh, enjoy. I don't know why she laughed so hard, because I'm really funny. But um, I'm glad that you guys are here. We're going to have a great time today. You know, Sandals, for those of you who have never been, Sandals can feel very, very modern. But I want you to know that our faith is ancient. It doesn't just go back 2,000 years when Jesus Christ was born and when he was crucified. It goes back even before that when the prophets of old, Abraham, Moses, Jeremiah, and Isaiah prophesied the coming one of the ancient days. And so today we gather with the church. We gather the church of the past, those who have believed, served, and died and are with Jesus in heaven. We gather today with the church present and we gather today with the church of the future, those who will, those who will believe and who will be saved. And for about the last thousand years. There's a church tradition. It's not a sandals tradition. It's a Christian tradition where the whole church gathers together. The pastor walks out and says he is risen and the church says he is risen indeed. So let's do that today. He is risen. risen Amen. Amen. I love you guys. I'm so glad that you're here. So let's bow our heads out of respect for Jesus and close our eyes because we have ADD and I will pray that God will bless my words, your ears, so he can reveal his truth. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for today. Thank you for Easter. Lord Jesus, we love you. We are grateful to you. Thank you for living the perfect life and dying the perfect death so that we could experience a perfect relationship with God. Lord, we love you. We honor you and we celebrate you and we pray to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want to welcome everybody, and apparently we have a lot of people outside in the lobby. Welcome. Who knew? We just built this box. Not big enough, but uh, I'm glad you guys are here. And so sandals may feel big, but you got to know that today over a billion Christians worldwide will, get, will gather to celebrate the risen Christ. Sandals is a small part, a very, very small part of what Jesus has done on earth. But he doesn't just want to change everybody's life. He wants to change your life. He doesn't just want to heal everybody's life. He wants to heal your life. He doesn't just want to save everybody's soul. He wants to save your soul. And so what I want to talk about today is I want to talk about how you can experience the healing power of Jesus. Because the reality is for many of you, it's been a while since you've been in church. Some of you, you've just come back and I don't know why you came back. Maybe grandma made you. I don't know what happened, but I'm glad you're here. But for some of you, you came to church and you left disappointed. Some of you got hurt, you got wounded in the church, you met some nasty people in the church, something went wrong. I meet people all the time and they say, no, I tried the church thing and it didn't work for me. And what I want to preach about today is I want to preach about the one miracle in the Bible that Jesus performed that didn't work. I want to talk about that because that's what some of you experienced. You needed a marriage healed. It didn't work. You prayed for someone to survive an illness and they died. Uh, you, you wanted something to happen in the church and it didn't happen. And so many of us find ourselves from time to time experience a miracle that didn't happen. And so I want to look at this story and I think that we can gain some wisdom today so that we can leave here today not just hearing about Jesus but experiencing the resurrection power of Jesus. So you have some notes in front of you, and so you can pull those out, and those notes do two things. They keep you on track and me on track so that I don't just start talking about something weird. So let's look at this together. How to experience the healing power of Jesus. I love this story. Like I said, it's the only time in Scripture where the miracle doesn't work. Mark 8, 22, it says, When they arrived at Bethsaida, some people brought a blind man to Jesus, and they begged him to touch him and heal him. Now, I want to stop there. And I just want to bring you up to date with who Jesus is. Jesus at this time is the most famous person in human history. He still is today. There has never been a person like Jesus. And there will never be a person like Jesus. He's the first global superstar. He's the first person whose name is spoken on every continent in the world. Here's this guy that came from nowhere. When Jesus Christ is discovered that he's from Nazareth, people say, does anything good come from Nazareth? It's like being born in Blythe, right? I mean, unless, of course, that's where you're from, and we're glad that you're here today. Welcome, okay? Okay. So, listen, 
What, what, what good can come from Nazareth? It's a podunk town in a podunk place, and yet this guy from nowhere changes everyone's life everywhere. He becomes the most foremost celebrity. He's more popular than King Herod. He's more famous than literally Caesar. He's more famous than Pilate. Everyone wants to see him. Jesus is a celebrity and everywhere he goes, there's a problem. When he takes a walk out into wilderness, 25,000 people follow him and he has to take a little boy's lunch to feed everybody, right? I mean, this is what happens. You never wanna have Jesus in your house why? Because you don't know what's going to happen. When Jesus shows up, all the people in your neighborhood you're trying to keep out, they come in. Like you don't know what's going to happen. One particular miracle that takes place, Jesus is preaching and the house gets so packed, kind of like today, there's no room. So some people cut a hole in the roof and lower their friends so he can be healed. That's a great story unless you own the house, right? Jesus is like, no, no, I don't do roofs. And he's on his way. That's somebody, that's somebody else's problem. So everybody wants Jesus to touch this guy, heal this guy. It's an unusual story. And if you don't know Jesus, understand this. You never know what Jesus is going to do. You never know what he's going to do. So Jesus took the blind man by the hand and he led him out of the village. What's the hardest thing for a blind person to do? Walk. Jesus says, come on, let's go for a walk. Takes him outside of the village. Takes him from where he's familiar to where he's not familiar. And by the way, this is what Jesus is going to do with all of us. He's going to take us to where we're familiar and comfortable, and he's going to move us to where we're unfamiliar and uncomfortable. So he takes him out, and I love this. Circle this. This is not me making this up. This is in your Bibles. This is what Jesus does. He takes the blind guy out. He's been asked to heal him, and Jesus says, come here, buddy, and he goes, and he hawks a loogie and spits in the guy's face. I'm not making this up. You never, can you, ima can you imagine, I mean, you know, following Jesus is like attending a Trump rally. You don't know what's going to happen, right? It's, it's like crazy, and I'm not endorsing or I'm not saying anything. So if you are offended, send your hate mail to Pastor Dan Crowley at sandalschurch.com. He will respond to you, okay? So you never, you never know what's going to happen, right? Jesus spits in this guy's face. It's like he already can't see. What are you doing? So he spits in the man's face. Then he lays his hands on him, and he says, can you see anything now? You know, it's like a bad Verizon commercial. Can you hear me now? Can you see anything now? I want you to notice his response, especially if you grew up in church. The guy lies. Yeah, totally. Absolutely, totally healed. And this is what we teach people to do in church. Fake it till you make it. And let me tell you something. If you want to get right with God, you got to get real with Jesus. The guy has not been healed. He's got spit in his eyes, but he can't see. He can't see. He says, yeah, I can totally see. I've been healed. I've experienced a miracle. But it didn't happen. He said, I see people, but I can't see them very clearly. He says, they kind of look like trees. Okay, if you are confused between people and trees, please don't drive home today. You cannot see. You cannot see. Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again. And his eyes were opened and his sight was completely restored and he could see everything clearly. Write these words down. In order to heal, I must learn to be real. And let me tell you this, as Americans, this is the most difficult thing for us to do because we fake it all day every day. From the time that we're little, we, we learn to pretend. When we come to church, we learn to play games and we're not real. Listen to me. Jesus cannot change your life until you are willing to be real. He won't do it. He won't do it. God won't heal you until you learn to be real with him. He, God is not interested in a fake relationship. John eight thirty two says this, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth. It's one of the most important statements Jesus ever makes. You can't lie your way to heaven. You can't lie your way into getting right with God. You've got to step into the light as he is in the light. You have to come out of the darkness into the light. You have to stop lying and embrace the truth. Only the truth will set you free. We're in a series called Luke 252. And this week we're studying Luke 13. Next week we'll be in Luke 14. But in Luke 13, this is the one verse we're going to look at. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? Now, why would somebody ask that? Because apparently what Jesus is saying is making the disciples feel like, man, a lot of people aren't going to understand what you're saying. And Jesus replied, he says, work hard to enter the narrow door to God's kingdom. For many will try to enter, but will fail. 
You see, not everybody who calls themselves a Christian is a Christian. Two years from now, I'm going to take another trip from Sandals to Israel. I hope you'll come with me. People are always afraid to go to Israel. It's safer there than it is here, okay? It just is. The Israelis understand security like Americans don't. It's a very, very safe place. One of my favorite places to go is the Church of the Nativity. The Church of the Nativity has been a place of worship in Bethlehem for 1,700 years. It's one of the oldest ongoing places of worship for Christians in the world. And people gather there. And when you go there, the church is epic. It's beautiful. It's massive. It looks like a castle. But what's amazing is the church is huge, but the door that you walk to enter is about that tall. Why? It doesn't matter whether you're Muslim, Jew, atheist, or a Christian. Anybody wants to go to the church of the nativity must humble themselves and kneel to meet God. And let me tell you something. There's something that the ancient church knew that we've forgotten today. We need to learn to humble ourselves. And the reason we don't is because we've forgotten where we are and where God is. We've forgotten to be real. So write this down. Following Jesus is about learning to be real with myself, God, and others. We're in a series called 252. And this is one of the most important verses. This verse describes the entire life of Jesus. And if you call yourself a Christian, you are to follow Jesus. The word Christian, it's not something, they didn't have a meeting and say, hey, what's a cool name we could call ourselves? In Antioch, it was actually a name making fun of people who follow Jesus. The word Christian means little Christ. That's what it means. Non-Christians coined that phrase to make fun of us as Christians because we were trying to become like Jesus. So how did Jesus live his life? The Bible says Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature, in favor with God and in favor with others. Jesus grew relationally in three areas, with himself, with God, and with others. And if you call yourself a Christian, you will begin to see this all throughout Scripture, this three-pronged relationship. When Jesus is asked, what's the most important commandment? Guess what he says? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You'll see this everywhere through Scripture. Now, there's this disciple, his name's John. If you're a teenager, he was probably about your age when he started to follow Jesus. He was the youngest disciple, and he lived to be the oldest. We don't know exactly how old, but somewhere around 100 years old when John died. He was so old, when he writes uh, John 3, he refers to elders as children. That's how old he is. When you're 100, everybody's a kid, right? I mean, that's just the way that it is. This is what he said. But those who say they live in God should live their lives, circle these words, as Jesus did. If you're not trying to live like Jesus, you are not following Jesus. And if you're not following Jesus, you are not a believer in Jesus. So as I follow Jesus, I need to learn to do three things. Number one, I got to learn to be real with myself. So Jesus says this, hypocrites, for you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. I want you to circle the word hypocrite. Now, most of us know, or kind of know what this word means. Like, right, if somebody calls you a hypocrite, it's not a good thing. The word has changed its meaning a little bit over 2,000 years. 2,000 years ago, the word didn't mean hypocrite in the sense that we think of it. What it meant was, write this down, it meant actor. So what Jesus used as almost a quasi cuss word, we use and we call them celebrities, right? Jesus was like, don't be this. Nowadays, we're like, oh my gosh, they're an actor. It's amazing, right? It's incredible. And this is what we do as a culture. My my daughter asked me to go see this movie with Leonardo DiCaprio. He won won an Oscar for his role in this movie called Revenant. Anybody see it? Okay, if you didn't see it, I'm going to ruin it for you. So get ready. I'm not going to ruin the whole movie. But there's a scene in the movie when he gets attacked by a bear. Now, I was not afraid of being attacked by a bear prior to seeing this movie. But after seeing this movie, I am fairly certain that being attacked by a bear is the worst way to die. I thought it was dying, being eaten by a shark, but now I think a bear is more terrifying because bears like to play with stuff. Like a shark's just going to eat you and you're in its belly. Like, you know, a bear's like, no, I'll come back, right? And it's going to maul you again. And I, it's like, there's this scene, right, where he's being thrown all over the place. And he's like, blah, blah, and it's just like terrifying. I'm like, oh my gosh, he deserves an Oscar. <laughs> he got attacked by a bear. But then I watched the making of the movie and it wasn't a bear. It was a man in a bear suit. Ah. <laughs> ah. 
Like that's not scary, that's creepy, right? Like if you see me downtown in a bear suit and I'm like, ah, ah, you're gonna walk on the other side of the street, but you're not afraid of me eating you, right? Or maybe you are, I don't know, okay? But right, we're like, oh my gosh, it was so amazing. It was fake, it was fake. And so 2,000 years ago, when you would go to watch a Greek play, the actors would walk out on stage and they would take a mask and they would place it in front of their face. And they would take on the role, listen to this, of a hypocrite. They would pretend to be something they are not. Jesus is not interesting, interested in you putting up a Christian mask. He wants you to be a real follower or he wants you to be real that you're not. You can't fake it till you make it. The vision of Sandals Church is for you to take down your mask and for you to follow Jesus. Here's what's so sad. You know who, who many of us have fooled today? We fooled ourselves. The Bible actually says that. Help me, Lord, to stop lying to myself. Hypocrites, for you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You see, I want you to look at those words, clean the outside. There's a word for this. It's called religion. We go to church, we play pretend, we all dress up, we look our best, and we think God is impressed. And not only do people dress up, but pastors dress up. Many of you have gone to religious organizations, right, where the pastor or the priest has a uniform. And it's awesome. And it's incredible. And it looks majestic. And then we all get so devastated when a pastor or a priest fails morally and they do something evil and we go, how could they do that? They had a uniform. Why? Because what you wear on the outside says nothing about who you are on the inside. Jesus doesn't want you to become religious. He wants you to kill your religious nature in you. Quit worrying about what's on the outside and start looking on what's in the inside. I mean, let, I mean, how many of us this morning paid way more attention to how we looked in the mirror than to who we are in our hearts? That's the reality. Jesus says, you blind Pharisees, first wash the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will become clean too. I don't know if you've noticed this, but God doesn't care how you look on the outside. Look around. Look, just look at, just look at each. Whoa. Look at me, look at my nose. I can smell things on Mars. It's not that big. <laughs> right? I mean, look at us. When we go to the zoo, we think we're looking at the animals. The animals are like, look at that guy. Look at, look at that guy. Whoa. Okay? Obviously, God doesn't care what we look at like on the outside. And what's amazing? What do we spend all our money on, people? Fixing everything on the outside. When God says the problem's on the inside. And when you change that you'll really be changed. Write this down. Jesus cares more about what's happening in me than around me. If you're not a Christian, let me tell you why you're so frustrated when you pray because you don't feel like God answers your prayers. Because what we pray is God changed my circumstances when God gave us our circumstances to help change us. So we ask God to take away the very thing God has sent to us that will help change what we really need. You don't need more money. You need a different heart. You don't need a husband, you need a relationship with Jesus. Okay, you don't need a new job, you need to be grateful for the one you have. We ask God to change our circumstances when God wants to change us. So why aren't we, why aren't we more aware of what's happening in us? Why are we so focused, so overly focused about everything that's going around? Number one, because we don't practice self-reflection. Nobody reflects anymore. We just tweet stuff. We just Facebook. We just Instagram it. Nobody thinks about the selfie. They just post it, right? Okay. There's a problem in our world today. We don't reflect. We don't until it's too late. Guys, you don't listen to your wife. You're not a good husband. You're not home. You're not, you don't pay attention. You don't listen until she's gone. Like some of you know, you know you should quit smoking. You know you need to eat less. You know you need to get in shape. You're, you're, you're not gonna change your behavior until it's too late and you have a heart attack or you have a couple months to live. Okay? You're not gonna change the way you parent until eight out of nine of them are in prison. Yeah, maybe we should have done some things different. Man. You know? Where's your kids? Well, they moved out. That's the bad news. Well, the good news is they're all in the same place. Christmas is great. Okay? 
The pro- here's the problem. We don't reflect until it's too late. And, and let me just say this. It's not just you. It's people. The, the Jewish nation of Israel was the same way. They didn't reflect until it was too late. There's a book in the Bible that nobody reads. Nobody reads it. Some of you have never even heard of it. It's called the Book of Lamentations. Okay? Why don't you read it? It's a boring name. Lamentations. It doesn't even sound fun. Okay? If you're religious, I'm going to offend you. Don't leave. I submit humbly that we change the name of the book Lamentations to Oh Crap. How many of you would read it then, right? Oh, yeah, I live there. I live there, right? What are you studying today? Oh, crap, right? I mean, why? Why? Because that's what happens. God, for 150 years, warns the nation of Israel, you better change, you better change, you better change. You better repent of your sin. You better turn. See, here's one of the things that many of you that are Christians think. You don't think, or if you call yourself Christian, you don't think God means what he says. The book of Lamentations says he means every word. He says, if you don't listen, if you don't turn back to me, he says, I will judge you. In the book of Lamentations, there's some guys by the name of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who are sold into slavery and carried off to Babylon. Listen to me, old guys, you're all murdered. Ladies, you're sold into prostitution and your children are carted off to the four corners of the world. The book of Lamentations, oh crap. Listen to this verse. Let us test and examine our ways. People always ask me, why is the vision of Sandals Church to be real with ourselves first? Because God is not the problem. You are. And here's the thing. Some of you are like, oh, I just got to change my life. I got to get out of Riverside and everything be different. You know what the problem is? When you moved to Kansas, guess who moved? You did. Right? And that's what people do. People are always trying to run away from themselves when what God wants you to do is change yourself. Change yourself. Then the location doesn't matter because you're different. But in order for that to happen, you're going to have to reflect. What needs to change about me? We need, to, we need to learn to think. How do I feel? What am I thinking? What am I doing with my life? The Bible says, behold, you delight in the truth, in the inward being. You teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Circle that word, the secret heart. People ask this question. I get asked this question constantly. People ask me, Pastor, why does God want me to pray if he already knows what I'm going to ask and what I need? Here's the answer. You don't know what you're going to ask and you don't know what you need. Why? Because God knows more about you than you know about yourself. Do you know that there are recesses in your heart? There are feelings in your heart? There are thoughts in your mind? There are emotions in your life that you haven't even felt yet that God knows about? God knows everything about you. So number one, we don't practice self-reflection. Number two, we are overly focused on others, right? We are so judgmental. Like when you go to the gym, you know you need to work out. What do you do? You find the guy more out of shape than you. Yeah, I see you over there, buddy. I'm watching you. You need to work out. Ladies, when you go to Target, you don't pay attention to your kids that look like little terrorists, right? You find that other mother. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? When you whack your kids, they deserved it, but she's abusive. That's that's abuse. Right? We're the same way. We go to Hometown Buffet, we judge everybody else's plate. Oh, yeah, yeah. Was that thirds, buddy? Thirds? It's the way we are. It's the way we are. We, We are so overly focused on others, right, ladies? Oh, she's inappropriate. Can't believe she wore that to church. You know, and you're here in a bikini. I mean, what, right? What is going on? I mean, we're just like, we just told, and you know what our problem is? Our eyeballs point out. I mean, we would be so much healthier if we could just pull them out and stare them back at ourselves. This is a true story. There was a guy in Southern California, got in a major car accident, major, almost died, knocked one of his eyeballs out, couldn't find it. Okay, the fireman looked for it. No, it's gone. No one could find it. So after he went through all the rehab and he worked and he, and he got back and he was healthy, they said, you lost an eyeball. And he said, no, no, I can still see out of that eye. He said, like, you can't see out of that eye. It, it, it was lost at the scene of the accident. We couldn't find your eyeball. He said, no, no, I can see. And they said, what do you see? He said, I can see my brain. And they're like, you're crazy. The guy wouldn't shut up. He kept telling his doctor, I can see, I can see, I can see, I can see. And finally to shut him up, they did an MRI on his skull. Turns out he did have an eyeball. It was knocked back into his sinuses, staring at his brain. Yeah. 
So I'm not going to pray that you get in a car accident and that happens. <laughs> but I do want you to have a collision with Jesus where he teaches you to look at yourself. Listen to what the Bible says. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log in your own? Right? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a big log in yours? Here's the word, hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, then you will be able to see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And some of you guys, you, you're a visitor at church today and you're so critical of what we're doing. Why? Because you're guilty of exactly what I'm saying. Who's he think you guys are so funny? It was a little plaid shirt and big nose. I mean, you're so critical. You know what's amazing to me? People, are, why don't you go to church? Christians are so judgmental. Well, so are you, right? I mean, when people say that, churches are so judgmental. Well, so you're making a judgment. You're doing exactly what you're accusing them of doing. Well, I'm never coming back. Okay, why? Because there's a log in your eye. Okay, and as Christians, man, we need to learn to help people. And the way we help people is by taking the log out of our, our eyes. Anybody in here ever had surgery? Raise your hands if you had surgery. Okay, would you allow your surgeon to perform surgery on you if he showed up in the morning, 6 a.m., 5 a.m.? They always do ridiculous hours. Okay, they're not normal people. Unless, of course, you're a surgeon here. Please tithe. We're glad you're here. Let's see. Right? It's always, it's always ridiculous hours. Can you imagine your surgeon shows up and he's like, you know what? I forgot my glasses but I'm feeling good. <laughs> okay, you're gonna make another appointment. <laughs> He's like, no, 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 trust me. No, no, no. You want him to see or her to see as clearly as possible so that they can do their job accurately. Listen to me, Christians. We're not trying to save lives. We're trying to save souls. So we better see clearly. But God doesn't want you just to be real with yourself. This is what Easter is all about. God wants you to be real with him. The cross makes being real with God safe. We can be real with God because God punished Jesus instead of you. Jesus died in your place. Jesus protects you from the wrath of God so we can be real with God. The Bible says the Lord is near to all who call on him. To all who call on him in what? In truth. Not only does the truth set you free, but the truth helps you be real with God and connect with God. I know some of you have friendships where they, your friends lie to you. You have kids, they lie to you. Did you do it? No, I don't know who did it. It was a dog. Some of you had spouses that have lied to you. And you hate it, right? No, nobody likes being lied to. Then why would God? Now, if you lie to me, I might know that you're lying. I might not. God always knows when you're lying. The Bible says this, if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. To be a Christian is to live in the truth, and that means you must learn to admit that you're a sinner. Now, here's the problem is, I want you to circle the word sin. When, 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 we, when we see the word sin, we, we see the word evil. And a lot of you have a hard time admitting that you're a sinner because there are other people in your life that are way, 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 way worse than you. And you're like, I'm not like that guy. And people always say, it's not like I killed anybody. When did that become the standard for good or bad? Like, that's a little scary, right? I almost killed him, but I didn't. I'm not that kind of guy. Okay. I want you to circle the word sin, and I'm going to tell you what it means. Here's what the, sin, the word sin means. It's an archery term. So think about an archer pulling back a bow, shooting an arrow, aiming for a target. At the dead center of the target is the bullseye, and that is perfection. This is what the Bible says. No matter how much we practice, no matter how much we aim, no matter how hard we try, every time we shoot for perfection as people, guess what happens? We miss the mark. And here's the problem. So many of you, you're like, well, I'm a good person. I'm going to stand before God. I'll be fine. And you know why you believe that? Because you compare yourself to those around you. Where in the Bible does it say the people around you are the standard to which you will be compared? The Bible says when you stand before God, your life will be judged according to the life of Jesus. And you know what that means? Even Mother Teresa missed the target. It's why we need Jesus. It says, if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. No matter what you've done, Jesus Christ's penalty on the cross can forgive you of your sin. 
Being a, becoming a Christian is asking Jesus to take your place on the cross. Here's what's beautiful. Not only does Jesus take away your sin when you place your faith and trust in him, but he puts his holiness on you. And so when you become a believer and you talk to God, it's like God is hearing directly from Jesus. Isn't that amazing? That's why you don't need me to pray for you. You can pray directly to God. If you're a follower of Christ, God isn't just God, he's your dad. And that's what the Bible says. Some of you though, you're like, great. Now, now I feel bad, I came to Easter. This is, why, this is why I don't wanna go to church, Pastor Matt. Because every time I come, I feel bad. Listen to me. Our vision isn't about being real so that you feel bad. Listen to this very carefully. Our vision is to teach you to learn to feel loved. Here's the problem in every single relationship, in every single human relationship, here's the truth. We're all trying to earn each other's love. Right, parents? That's why you're so nice to your kids because you don't want to put you in a home when you're old. <laughs> remember this, Johnny. Remember, daddy was good. It was mom. It was mom. <laughs> Sir. Right, ladies? This is why you got to look like you're 20 even when you're 85. Got to get everything, you know, <laughs> right? Can't have my 93-year-old husband's eyes wandering. He can't see anything. He, can't see. <laughs> he doesn't even know it's you. Right? We're all trying to earn each other's love in our friendships. That's why we're so competitive. Oh, you can't be friends with them because they're super cool. Right? Constantly. Look, look, look at the turmoil that we face. It's because none of us know what love is. Because we're all on a hamster wheel trying to earn everybody's love. And the Bible says if you're trying to earn love, then it isn't love. So if you don't believe me, let me prove it to you. This is what the Bible says about love. Love is patient. Okay, most of you are out right now. Love is kind. That's why my wife started a ministry on kindness, to convict me. <laughs> love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It doesn't demand its own way. Guys, listen to this. It's not irritable. You're like, now I'm irritated. <laughs> right, ladies? Guys, we get irritable. Ladies, listen to this one. It keeps no record of wrongs. You're like, I'm going to write that down right now. It does not rejoice about injustice, but it rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. It's always hopeful. It endures through everything. And so when people say, oh, we just fell out of love, then you were never in love. Because love never ends. It never gives up. And you cannot earn God's love. He gave it to you. He gave it to you. Because he loves you. The Bible describes God as love. And once you realize, once you realize you don't have to earn God's love, it will change your life. You will become secure, you will be made well, and you will know, you will know that you are loved. You will know that you matter. And let me tell you why this is so important because most of us don't get this in our families. We don't get this in our friendships. We don't get this in our marriages. We've got to get this from God. We need it. But it's not enough just to be real with God. God's building a family. And he wants you, last point, number three, to learn to be real with others. In the book of Genesis, man, God creates all these things and it's great, it's good, and it's awesome. There's only one thing in the first two chapters of Genesis that aren't good. God says it's not good for man to be alone. God never designed you to go through this life on your own. Not only does God want you to have a personal relationship with Jesus, but he wants you to learn to have a personal relationship with his family, the church. The Bible says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Underline this, so that you may be healed. You want to heal? You got to get real. We confess our sins to God to be forgiven. We confess our sins to each other to experience healing. And this is why so many of you don't get healed because you're not real. You just got loogie in your eye. And Jesus is like, did it work? You're like, yeah, totally. And you hit a tree. Listen to me. Every single Christian should proudly and boldly proclaim that we're sinners. I invited a friend of mine to church this week. He's gone through a divorce. He's gone through a tough time. He's made some mistakes. I invited him to Easter services. You know what he said to me? He said, you're telling me there's room at your church for me? I was like, yeah, we got tons of idiots just like you. 
come on, come on. The Apostle Paul, who wrote half the New Testament, think about this. He wrote half of the New Testament Bible, half of everything we know about Jesus, half of everything we know about how to be saved, half of everything we know about how to live out our lives as Christians comes from the Apostle Paul. This guy rebuked the Apostle Peter. If you go to the Vatican, the Vatican where the Pope resides is built over the tomb of Peter. And the Apostle Paul rebuked Peter when he was in sin. If anybody could be kept in holy, it's Paul. Listen to what he says. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. Why would he say that? Because he felt bad? No, 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 no. Because the Apostle Paul learned to feel love. And he knew how much God loved him, and he took no confidence in himself but all of his confidence was in God's love. The Apostle Paul would go on to say that the reason Christ Jesus had mercy on him is so that other people as well could know they could be saved, that sinners would know there's room for them in the church. And I want you to know, as a sinner, there's room for you at Sandals Church. So our last point, Sandals Church is a safe place to become real. We don't expect you to be perfect. We worship the perfect one. We worship the ancient of days. We worship the one who was, who is, and is to come. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and the end. He's the one who made you. He's the one who created you. And he died on a cross for you. A lot of people ask me, why'd you name the church Sandals? Is it like the resort? I was like, no, I was poor. I didn't know there was a resort named Sandals, okay? I named our church Sandals because in the 90s, sandals became really cool to wear. I don't know if you remember this. It was super cool in the 90s to start wearing sandals. And I had this horrible toenail fungus. Anybody seen, you know, if you got, you got the, don't raise your hand. You don't want to admit this. <laughs> but if you've, seen the, if you've seen the commercials, it's a little crunchy guy and he like eats under your toenail. He's like, kah, 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 kah. well, those guys lived in my feet. And I was mortified. I was so embarrassed of the way my feet looked. When Tammy and I got married, she used to make me sleep with my feet pointing outside the bed. She called my Frankenstein toes. It was, they were hideous, okay, hideous, disgusting. It's like something from The Walking Dead. And I would only wear sandals if I was totally confident that the people I was around loved me and wouldn't make fun of my feet. And that's when God said, I want you to start a church where people will love you and will look past your ugliness and see the beauty of me in you. And that's where the name Sandals Church comes from. And then I found this great verse, Romans 10, 15, blessed are the feet, even toenail infected fungal feet. Blessed, beautiful, beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. What's the good news? You don't have to be perfect because Jesus is. Listen, I hope you know this because if you know the truth, Jesus says it will set you free. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for all those who've gathered. Lord, thank you for dying for us on the cross. We love you, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, that those who have visited today would be inspired by you and would fall in love with your church like I have and come back. Lord, bless us with the truth because it is only the truth that will set us free. We pray this in Christ's name, amen.